you're invited to listen to Inside Schizophrenia, a new podcast brought to you by PsychCentral.com, home of the Psych Central Show. Enjoy. Welcome to Inside Schizophrenia, a look into better understanding and living well with schizophrenia. Hosted by renowned advocate and influencer Rachel Star Withers and featuring Gabe Howard. Listeners, could a change in your schizophrenia treatment plan make a difference? There are options out there you might not know about. Visit OnceMonthlyDifference.com to find out more about the benefits of Once Monthly Injections for Adults with Schizophrenia. Welcome to Inside Schizophrenia. I'm Rachel Star Withers here with my co-host Gabe Howard. And Gabe, I'm so excited about today's episode because we're going to be exploring schizophrenia in children, sometimes known also as early psychosis, childhood schizophrenia, very early onset schizophrenia, and schizophrenia childhood type. So did you get all those written down? It's amazing to me that there's all of these different names for what is essentially the same disorder. Yeah. You can understand why people are having a hard time understanding what's going on when we have five names for what is effectively the same thing. And has been changed over and over and confused with other disorders. It, yeah. And that's kind of what we're going to get into is how it's all meshed together and it's hard to tell what is what. Before we get into all of the research and the technical side, and of course, coming up later on in the show, we have an expert who's going to answer some of these questions for us. I have a question for you, Rachel. Were you diagnosed as a child? I was not. I was first diagnosed when in my early 20s when things were like really spiraling out of control. When I was growing up and I grew up in like the deep south, very religious and in the country. So it's not like I didn't really grow up around other kids like I did, but it wasn't, you know, like a city situation. So I don't think my parents really knew how a kid was supposed to act. <laughs> it, there were no like big warning signs with me. Did you have hallucinations when you were a child? Oh, I as long as I can remember. I've had hallucinations. And the first ones were I always saw faces in things, like faces in trees, in the carpet, uh, just in the wall, the ceiling, they would appear. And they're like always scary faces, not like happy, no happy butterflies. They were like kind of demonic, frightening features, which goes back to being in the religious South. You know, when I did tell people about it, they'd be like, oh, well, that's Satan manifesting. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. You told adults, hey, I'm seeing scary, evil, demonic faces. And they were just like, that's normal. Yeah. I, I think it probably freaked them out. Or they just thought, hey, this little kid is just really imaginative. And you've been sitting in church listening to the preacher holler for the past two hours about hell and brimstone. Of course, you know, everyone's probably seeing scary demons. <laughs> Religious stuff aside, how do you know the difference between a child's imaginary friend and a child's hallucination? I know lots of children who have imaginary friends who do not have schizophrenia. Oh, absolutely. And I think growing up, it kind of freaks some people out that they don't know how to deal with it. Like if your kid is coming with an imaginary friend and... You're like, oh, okay, you know, we'll play along. But well, yeah, when do I stop playing along? When is my child too old for this? The same thing, like, when is my child too old to believe in Santa? <laughs> so now my kid's hitting 13 and they're still talking to somebody imaginary. Mm, maybe, maybe this is bad. You raise a really good point because some of this, you know, the, the tooth fairy, the Easter bunny, Santa Claus. Yeah. We want children to be fanciful. They always see and hear and do things that the rest of us don't as part of their imagination, as part of normal development. So now you're a parent and you suspect. So now you Google to try to get some help for your child. What will they find? So scariest thing, when I was researching this episode, I, I Googled childhood schizophrenia. And the first thing that comes up is the Wikipedia link. And it's a picture of a child holding a gun. <laughs> like... I, I got so mad if you would have been on Twitter at the time when this happened. I just went on a little Twitter rampage of this is stigma and ridiculous because for, I mean, it's like a little 10 year old holding a gun at the camera. And we just last episode talked about violence and schizophrenia and the stigma and just how people see it incorrectly. And this is like actual kids, stigma towards kids in mental health. And that really blew my mind that you know, even on the internet, we have that stigma towards children and getting help for mental illnesses. And this puts parents in a very peculiar situation because they're going to look at this picture 
of a 10 year old with a gun and then they're going to look at their own child and they're going to think, well, all I have to do is make sure that my child's not violent. Mm -hmm. Ipso facto, my child does not have schizophrenia. In today's times, we have the situations of so many school shootings and I feel like you have two sides of the parenting. You have the one side that's going to be overprotective and, oh my gosh, I don't want this to happen. And then the other side, like, I don't want to say anything and have my child labeled. So it's either, I think, go crazy and get help or don't get any help at all. That's really an interesting point that you make that because of the, the stigma surrounding this, people are afraid that if they suspect that their child might have schizophrenia, they'll get labeled as such even if they don't. So people will become fearful of their child. Maybe their child will lose friends or social connections or or standing in school, things that their child needs to develop normally. If they suspect their child has schizophrenia and they're wrong, they'll put their child back a little bit. And that, of course, is assuming that parents recognize it at all. How did your parents react to that, knowing that even though you were symptomatic as a child, they did nothing? What was that like? Ooh, we've... <laughs> I've actually never asked them that because that sounds like a really sad question, Gabe. Why would I put my parents on the spot like that? Um, I, I was a little weird kid and I think all kids are weird though. And I was the first child and I just, I don't, I don't blame them or anything because I feel like they were amazing parents and, you know, Rachel's acting weird. Let's, let's go outside and play and that'll help her. I don't know. So I had a very like awesome childhood and things. It's awesome. It, that it all turned out okay, but you, you and I both know that it it doesn't always turn out okay. No. You know, some sometimes waiting too long can lead to not so great outcomes. We're talking about society not helping people who are sick. And I had a family situation where my mother pretty much worked from home, my father worked full time, and it was just me and my little brother. So we got a lot of like personal attention. So even if I had, let's say gotten worse, I feel like people would have noticed pretty quickly. So let's actually talk about what is childhood schizophrenia. The simple definition is it is when a child interprets reality abnormally, which I think is all children. <laughs> Isn't that all <laughs> well, but it's, it's abnormally. <laughs> yeah. But, but you're right. Doesn't, doesn't that make it difficult? You expect a child to get it right? Right. Yeah. Um, so the mental disorder of schizophrenia overall. Okay. They used to see it as different classifications. Now it's considered a spectrum disorder, similar to autism. So the criteria for diagnosing a child with schizophrenia is actually the exact same as a teenager or adult. So early onset of schizophrenia is ages 13 to 18. And if it occurs between age seven to puberty, it's childhood. So I think that's the issue too, is we got like, okay, well, which one is it? And then they're also trying to just call it early psychosis or psychosis in children, which is even a more bigger umbrella term because I feel like that could cover bipolar and all the other disorders that kind of have hallucinations in it, which autism has hallucinations and Down syndrome also. There is not a definitive test. And they've even done studies where they think schizophrenia can appear in a child as early as three months old. I have no clue how in the world you would figure that out. Like a three month old is just kind of there. But I just thought that was interesting that they think that's how young that schizophrenia can be observed in a child. The only difference is schizophrenia for children versus adults is the delusions tend to be broader. So they don't necessarily have like a voice telling them specific things to do. It's more they're going to hear sounds, knocking, ticking, voices that are like calling their names that necessarily don't make sense. The visual hallucinations tend to be like flashing lights, seeing shadow figures. So that's the other thing. It's like, that just sounds to me like normal kids. <laughs> I mean, if my little kid comes and tells me like, oh, God, there are all these flashing lights and it's an alien, uh, you know, attacking. I'd be like, oh, OK, cute. You know, you must have saw that on TV. But yeah. Children just have a real difficult time processing anything as an adult. You know, take, for example, all of the kids cartoons that have like sexual innuendo in them. Oh, I remember as a young prepubescent girl like we would watch musicals like Grease and I loved Grease as a kid it was so happy and fun and I remember they showed it to us in school and now if I watch it I'm like oh wow that's really inappropriate <laughs> like there's so many things in that movie that older movie that is just like oh oh that's there's a lot of sex jokes in here and yeah we miss things as kids like we interpret things completely different if you don't understand something you just kind of either gloss over it or 
you make up your own reality to it. But that's yeah. not an example of schizophrenia. That's just an example of getting something wrong. Oh, yeah. So now we go all the way back. And in, like you said, we're, we're not even necessarily talking about 15-year-olds. We're talking about 10-year-olds or 5-year-olds. And remember, Gabe, even trying to go out there and get the right facts to learn about this disorder, you're met with a lot of confusion and a lot of stigma. And I think a lot of that stigma also can make you feel like, well, and if my child is wanting, you know, to shoot up the school, like in this picture, that means I'm a bad parent and I'm not. I love my child. And it's just a lot of confusion. And I think fear when you are looking up this disorder. And we should probably address how common this is, because I, I imagine this is not very common, which means it's not like you can just ask your your mommy group or your your father group or your your own family members. I mean, where do you go to get support with the people that you know in real life? One of the issues when it comes to diagnosing this is that schizophrenia and psychosis in children is so closely seen from the outside as also autism. So there's a lot of kind of confusion there where a lot of kids get misdiagnosed. They put them down as autistic and they're really not and vice versa. And with autism, children are seen to be very internal, going inside of their heads. They don't pick up on like normal social cues. They engage differently. Schizophrenia is they withdraw, they go inside themselves. They're not responding correctly because they're hallucinating. That sounds exactly the same. To me, I feel like if I had two kids going through two different things, but that's how they're reacting, I would assume they're both either autistic or schizophrenic. But yeah, there's a very big difference in what the kids are seeing. We're talking about a 10-year-old, though, and they're telling me they're seeing shadows and lights. That's so vague. <laughs> Do you think that the public is more accepting of a child with autism or a child with schizophrenia? I don't think anyone is scared of an autistic child shooting up a school. Is that, is that a little too hard to say, though, Dick Gabe? No, I, I think oh, that okay, it's I'm a, just being honest. No, I, I think it's a very okay. fair point. Okay. You know, schizophrenia, like you always make the joke, it's got a Z in it. It's a scary sounding word. When we think of autism, we think of, you know, cute children trying their best to love their parents. And can you kind of speak to that a little bit? Because you don't have the warm and fuzzy diagnosis. No. And, uh, and I actually had a family member who had very, very serious autism who is no longer with us, um, who was very young. And autism, it's a very hard thing to deal with. When we go back to that spectrum disorder, there's a big spectrum. And unfortunately, my family member was a very, very held back mentally by it. And I don't think anyone was ever scared of him that he would pull out a gun. You know, no one was ever scared like that. You are more scared for him. You felt bad. You were worried about him. Whereas schizophrenia, I think you're going to be like, oh, I, I don't want my kids near him. I don't want my kids near her. Like that, that, that's going to be the kid that just starts like stabbing people. But there's fear that autistic kids will be disruptive in the classroom. So there's stigma on both sides. Another thing is that we go back to that whole getting a diagnosis for my child. There's a lot more support and just help and programs for autism. You know, so if I'm Googling, you know, help with psychosis, there's almost next to nothing for children. Where autism, there's so many programs, there's books, there's these computer games, there's just so much stuff that you're like, oh, wow, there's a huge support community that does not exist for psychosis in children, even though it's so closely related. Um, as a parent, that would worry me too. I'd be like, well, if I have to get a diagnosis, how about the safer one, even if it's wrong, I would get a lot more help. It, it's a really good point. There, there's nothing to definitively prove psychosis in anybody, schizophrenia in anybody, uh, let alone children. It's all self-reporting. So this does make it difficult. And that does mean that, you know, unfortunately, human error can get involved and a, a parent can steer their child, steer their provider into the safer diagnosis. And it, it's always difficult to compare and contrast illnesses. I don't want anybody to think that we're saying that autism is better than schizophrenia or vice versa. Correct. It's just a conversation about how society is seeing these illnesses and why it makes it difficult to get the right diagnosis and the right help for a child when there's all of these external factors. And coming to getting the right help, right now with psychosis for children, schizophrenia, the only help, the only treatment is the exact same thing for adults, which is antipsychotic medications and which have really intense side effects. A lot of them aren't allowed to be given to children to start with, but a lot of the side effects I have now, I would not wish on anybody else, but especially not a child. So you have that whole thing playing well 
okay, if I give my child this, certain things might become a lot worse. And your other treatment options are going to be like social programs, individual therapy, a lot of family therapy, so everybody in the family can kind of jump in. The treatment isn't really a specific, okay, I just give them this pill every day at this time and everything's going to be okay. Well, let's talk about that for a second. Because as you know, in adults... There's a lot of controversy about whether or not people should take psychiatric medications. There, there's lots of scary stories. And now we're talking children. So now a parent has to decide if they want to give uh, psychiatric medications to their child, knowing that adults are having this giant discussion. What is that like for a parent? For just me, and you'll hear other schizophrenics say it too, it's you're playing Russian roulette with medication. So you're constantly having to try things, adjust levels, and now we're dealing with a child who isn't very good at voicing what's happening. And that parent is going to have to be like really on top of things and charting. And it's just a lot is going to fall on the parents when it comes to psychosis in children. And it's more likely than not that their friends and family and the general society is really looking down on them. Oh, you don't want to raise your child. You just want to give them a pill. This isn't to say that children with schizophrenia shouldn't be on medication, but these are the things parents worry about. There's just an incredible amount of stigma in the treatment of schizophrenia. Yes. And when I was researching all of this, I then went into researching specific therapists who deal with schizophrenia, psychosis, and they're all a lot more expensive than, let's say, a normal therapist. So there's also just the cost of all of this is insane. You know, when one of the treatment sites suggested family therapy once a week, child therapy twice a week, you know, and we're talking $100 a pop, like that adds up on a family really quick. So you want to give your child everything. You want to help them. But there's also that cost factor of trying to do all of this stuff. And a lot of it's not available in your area. If you're in a big city, you can probably find a therapist who specializes. But I mean, I'm out in South Carolina and no one came up on my Google search. And I think that it's also important to remember that families are all structured differently. For example, you can have a single parent family with three children. Well, that means one child is taking up the majority of not only the financial resources, but the single parent's time. And then you've got other families that, you know, are, are two parents with one child. Well, and of course, we all understand the difference in health insurance, financial resources. And as you mentioned, the difference between living in a big city and a rural area. And it even varies state to state. We'll be right back after this message from our sponsor. It can sometimes feel like another schizophrenia episode is just around the corner. In fact, a study found that patients had an average of nine episodes in less than six years. However, there's a treatment plan option that can help delay another episode, a once-monthly injection for adults with schizophrenia. If delaying another episode sounds like it can make a difference for you or your loved one, Learn more about treating schizophrenia with once monthly injections at oncemonthlydifference.com. That's oncemonthlydifference.com. We are back talking about schizophrenia in children. Is there good news in all of this? What's the success rate for a child who is diagnosed early and gets the intervention and help that they need? How do these children end up? Because I I believe that society thinks that all of these children end up institutionalized or as as criminals or in prison. What are the actual stats on this? Is there hope for these children? It's just like any other medical situation. If you have the right diagnosis and the right treatment, you're going to have a lot better outcome. Be myself, like I said, I wasn't diagnosed till later, but once I was, that was such a huge weight off my shoulders. For one, I knew I wasn't demon possessed anymore, (laughs) Uh, but like, oh, I have a real thing that other people in this world have. And I knew how to, I at least had a road to go down for treatment. I knew that I needed to talk to a psychologist, psychiatrist, like I knew what type of doctors, what type of medication I was going to need, what type of therapy. And There is no like, oh, well, this is the exact thing you need to do that'll work for you. Because believe me, over the past 14 years, I've tried so many things and had to adjust. But at 34, I'm about to be 34, happy birthday to me, things are going really well, I think. I'm as sane as I've ever been. I don't know, but I have a really awesome life. And I'm very lucky for that. So I think it's just the outcome is whatever you want it to be. And just being able to support your child and 
push them to what they want to do and find ways. Yes, it's going to be harder, but you can totally find ways. You can find ways if you get the right diagnosis and the right treatment. J- just to clarify, right? You can't find the right way magically. That that That's right. the problem with all of this misinformation and all of this stigma. It leads you astray. Yes, that's correct, Gabe. Let's take a snapshot of your personal story, Rachel. Before you had the right diagnosis, before you had any treatment whatsoever, you went through a lot. But tell us what happened before diagnosis to help you with your hallucinations. I remember multiple times in my life um, growing up, like I said, in the church, going to different church leaders over me, youth pastors, things like that, and talking to them about what was happening. And a lot of the times they would just pray with you and suggest, you know, what to read in the Bible. And that was it. And it kind of escalated to the point where I was at a Christian school at age 17 and they actually did an exorcism on me. And it was not as cool as the movie. My head did not spin around and I didn't, you know, throw up puke everywhere. So little let down on the buildup of that, just saying. But that's really scary that they did that to a 17 year old. But That was their way of um, helping me. And they absolutely knew. I mean, we're not talking I was in the sticks. We had the internet starting. um, And this was a very, like, large school. I love your sense of humor. And I love the fact that you're well enough to look back and, you know, handle these things the way that you do. But if we're being honest, this could have turned out significantly worse for somebody in your position, a vulnerable person with an untreated mental illness. Yes, I have a great sense of humor. I tend to be very upbeat about schizophrenia and mental disorders because so many people aren't. And inside, I might not be like super happy, but this is my way of dealing kind of thing. So I did want to point that out there just as I make jokes about these things and other people might have went through them and like, this is not a joke, just so you kind of understand. But that was really hard, that exorcism. I didn't talk about it for over 10 years because I was so embarrassed. Like, who in the world has an exorcism? Like, I just did not want anyone to know. So it's not that that didn't affect me. Um, it affected me really bad for a lot of years. And it took a long time to deal with that. So yes, if you have people that are trying in their own ways to help, but are actually hurting, it really can set anyone back that has any sort of medical problem, not even just mental. And just to be clear, it did not help with schizophrenia. Yes, to be clear, uh, my exorcism did not work. And it was three days long. Okay, so this was not an hour situation like in the movies. Got to wrap those up quick. Um, A three day long exorcism and my hallucinations came back the next day and they um, pretty much gave up on me. They said I let Satan back in. Okay, so so there was a lot of blaming of the person oh, yeah. who was sick, and, and none of this, and I don't think you think so either. We're, we're not trying to, to shame religion or shame religious people. This is just an example of where people didn't understand, and they used what resources they had available, but they did the wrong thing. They, they didn't use a medical-based model to treat you because you didn't have a diagnosis and they didn't know what to do. Now, let's compare that to what happened when you got to a doctor. How did your life change after you got a diagnosis and, and you moved forward? Anyone out there who you know is looking to get a psychiatrist, psychologist, looking to go down this road, you might have to shop around. I do want to say that because I've been to so many different therapists and medical professionals across the board. And you do have to find one that works for you. But the good thing is that you at least have a game plan. So I knew right away, like, okay, I'm going to go. I started talking to a psychologist. That psychologist put me in contact with a psychiatrist. And them working together put me on a medical treatment plan in, in addition to the talk therapy that I was doing. So, yeah, and it was, okay, if that didn't work this week, then we need to work on something else. We need to change something. Not, all right, we give up. We tried that one thing. And that really is the difference. You now had a treatment plan. So as scary as it is to take your child to a doctor for this, the treatment outcomes are significantly better. And as people who listen to all of these episodes know, and people who know your work, Rachel, you really do have an exceptionally high quality of life. I mean, you were in the movies for Pete's sake. I was. It's pretty cool. I think now, Gabe, is a perfect time to bring on our guest. Today, we're talking with Dr. Joseph Gonzalez Heydrich. He is the Director of Developmental Neuropsychiatry Clinic at Boston Children's Hospital and an Associate Professor of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Welcome, doctor. Thank you, Rachel. So at the Boston Children's Hospital in the Developmental Center, what is it that you do? I'm a child psychiatrist. 
and I evaluate children thought to be having very serious psychiatric problems, then um, treat them, hopefully get them feeling better and back on developmental, on their developmental course again. So when you say psychiatric issues, what would some of those be? I would say since uh, 2001 or so, I've been mostly concentrating on children who uh, are showing early signs of psychosis. Those are the children that have generally been my, my new patients in the last, I guess, eight years. You know, since I've been working in this area, I would tell you that I've, I've never worked harder or seen children who are more having more, you know, more severe problems. And yet sort of the partnership with the families and the, and the kids themselves is really very strong. We're all pulling together, trying to help them feel better. And also, I'm involved in research to try to understand, you know, why this is happening to them and, and find ways to, that are more effective than what we have now to really uh, get them back, you know, feeling better and back on, you know, the d- developmental trajectory. Rachel and I were just having a big discussion about parents are afraid of this diagnosis. They're afraid of psychosis because society is afraid of this in adults and, and nobody wants to stigmatize their child with this. Are you seeing that in your practice where parents are rejecting the diagnosis or not wanting to work with you or are fearful of it? Actually, um, by the time the kids come to see me, often the parents are looking for an answer and have felt blamed or, or, or blown off by the professionals often before that. And part of that is because psychosis in children is, is very confusing and difficult. A lot of kids will have, just as far as the normal development, will occasionally have things they hear a voice, their name called, developmentally normal fears and, and whatnot. And then distinguishing those from psychotic symptoms is hard. And it's something that the field has been grappling with. So, so the kids are often been complaining of intrusive voices and images that are really scary and frightening and distressing to them for a long time. First of all, they also feel a stigma and often don't tell anyone about it for a long time. And then when they do tell their parents about it and the parents go to get evaluate, that evaluation, often as child psychiatric professionals, we try and find any possible other explanation and in truth, it is hard to distinguish what's a psychotic symptom, you know, for instance, voices telling the child to harm themselves or telling them terrible things about them from developmentally normal things, or, and also symptoms of other disorders that might transiently look like that. So childhood schizophrenia is uh, narrowly defined to look exactly like the you know, adult, late adolescent, early adult onset illness it is rare in children, but children having psychosis that's impairing and distressing is still rare, but much more common than schizophrenia. And so the other part is how you distinguish that from normal imaginative play, imaginary friends, uh, just transient misperceptions that children might have, uh, nightmares, um, and how you distinguish those sort of normal developmental phenomenon from psychosis. And then within psychosis, you know, which kids will go on to have schizophrenia versus some other sort of psychotic illness that may or may not last. Talking about these kids, what are the ages that you see experiencing childhood psychosis? And what's your earliest age that you've seen? Typically, the kids that we've been getting referred to us, because we've been concentrating on very early onset. So in about 20% of people with schizophrenia uh, and probably psychosis in general will have their first clear psychotic episode in adolescence after the age of 13 and probably closer to 16, 17, 18. And those are called early onset, and that's about 20% of everybody with this problem. Very early onset, which would be under the age of 13, is much rarer. And we've been concentrating on those kids because they've been getting referred to us here at Children's Hospital. So I've been mostly seeing kids who have the onset before the age of 13. But again, that's a rare event. But because we're a tertiary care center, these kids get sent here. So we've enrolled in in our research studies uh, for the genetic study, over 140 of these kids, and actually counting the studies we're doing with biomarkers before that, closer to 200 kids. Their ages, again, because I'm selecting for kids who starts under the age of 13, really are typically 9, 10, 11, 12. Um, But we've had, I saw a kid this week who uh, at age four went from having a touch of mild autism and a very verbal, very engaged kid who would tell you lots of stories go through a period of hallucinations that were very frightening to him and basically have a deterioration in his functioning to the point now where he he hardly talks and his interest in play and engaging people has markedly decreased. That's an unusual case. And we see maybe five or six kids like that. More typically, their uh, onset is between eight and 13. So it seems like a very heterogeneous group. And the genetics are very heterogeneous and marked by 
a lot of very rare genetic events, more so than what you see in, in typical late adolescent, young adult onset psychosis. If there are parents out there and they're suspecting that their child may have a problem with psychosis, what do you suggest that they do? Well, I would take them in to be evaluated by a professional. And I'd also observe carefully, you know, write down with observations that they have, they're making them worry about this. If the child's behaving oddly, it's, also, it's really helpful to get a video of that so that the professional in the office can view it with the parent to try and figure out what's going on. And then depending uh, on how gradually it happened, et cetera, there might be some neurologic workup that has to happen. So an EEG, depending if, if again, if there's been a very abrupt onset, then we'll worry about things that can look like schizophrenia, but are autoimmune disorders, antibodies attacking the brain, you know, relatively infrequently, but those are things you don't want to miss. Metabolic uh, problems that need to be diagnosed and then could be treatable. And so it's important to take, get an, an evaluation. There should be strong consideration of, neuro, of medical and neurologic causes along with the, the psychological, psychiatric evaluation. So likely it would be best to have someone who has um, a lot of experience evaluating childhood onset psychotic symptoms to really take a look and see how typical is this of the kids that, that have those sort of problems versus uh, very frequently, it might be not that. It might be misinterpreting things that are either due to another problem like a major depression or an anxiety disorder, or sometimes also just developmentally normal things. So I think getting an evaluation would be important and careful observation, having observations would be very important. When it comes to treating the child, are there side effects with medications that we should consider? There's two issues with them. And they're the antipsychotics. As you mentioned, they have side effects, the flattening and, and how people just feel sedated or they just, they're not fun to take. You know, people often, you know, will take the medication because, you know, because they've learned that, 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 that if they don't, they're, they're, they're tortured by these terrible psychotic symptoms or voices. But then um, but, but, but the medication themselves do feel, make you feel flatter and duller and harder to enjoy things and whatnot. Um, you know, it might be on the whole Plus, if you're getting rid of voices constantly telling you terrible things and, and whatnot, the, the things that are most difficult about, especially the second generation into psychotics, uh, is the weight gain and metabolic problems. So they increase appetite, um, some more than others, but they all seem to increase appetite and make it harder for the kids and for everyone who takes them to keep their weight at a healthy level. And so the kids will uh, gain weight. And then, you know, and then we worry that it's going to put them at the longer term risk of type 2 diabetes and metabolic syndrome and all the complications of obesity. So that's actually the biggest problem is those side effects. The families, by the time they come to see me, they are ready uh, and they want some help. The other problem with these medicines, though, is that they're not completely effective. They're treating symptoms. They're not treating the underlying cause. And so while you might be able to get hallucinations and delusions under control, the other symptoms having to do with decreased motivation, decreased concentration, decreased sort of ability to get up and do stuff. But those are really uh, still there, and we haven't found a good way of treating those. Part of the research that, that we're doing, you know, we're looking for these rare genetic causes, because the hope is if we understand the genetic cause, we can go from the gene to knowing what the gene makes to knowing what that protein does, and we can do these amazing things now that would sound like science fiction uh, even 10 years ago where we can take kids' blood cells and turn them into uh, neurons and study the neurons in a dish and try and understand what's wrong with the neurons and then screen lots and lots of medicines to see if any of them will reverse what's wrong with the neurons. So we're looking for new treatments that might prevent the symptoms from coming up to begin with and be more effective in reversing symptoms than the treatments we have now, which are less in symptoms, but they don't get at the underlying cause. The parents are usually are willing to go with the medications because they've been, they've been seeing their child suffer for a long time uh, with very significant, serious symptoms. We still have battle with ourselves in terms of can we do this with a, with a medication which has less side effects. We've had kids respond to Prozac family medicines where classically my thought they would have used an antipsychotic and some of them will respond to that. And that's great because those have a lot fewer of those problems that I just discussed. But often they do need the antipsychotic and then we have to work hard to maintain their well away to the healthy level, make sure they're getting exercise and then the other treatments of psychosis, which are medication, which have to do with helping the school understand the child and how to best teach them and support them. And then the people that are looking into things like cognitive rehabilitation and whatnot to try and get back some of the functioning that might have been lost um, as a psychotic process took hold. 
We were talking earlier in the episode about seeing this from an everyday person's point of view, but seeing it from a scientist's point of view now, that's really awesome. And thank you so much for coming and sharing that with us, sir. No, th- thank you so just for raising awareness, because I think that one of the things that I think is really hard about this is a uh, lack of awareness, lack of understanding you know, in our society of this. It makes it harder for kids to get the treatment. It makes it harder on families who end up getting feeling blamed and whatnot for something which has a large component that's biological and causation and not, and not in their hands. Thank you again. We really appreciate it. And we've learned a, a lot. All right. All right. Thank you so much. That was really awesome. And I am so thankful that we had somebody from Boston's Children's Hospital associated with Harvard Medical School. They really do great research and they're looking into schizophrenia to make life better for well, frankly, everybody with mental illness, because this is this is cutting edge and this is important. And I'm so glad that he was willing to take the time. Rachel, how did you get him to do this? Well, um, when he was talking about some of that research there that they did on genetics, uh, they'd actually contacted me a few years back and I've been involved in some of those genetics programs he was speaking about as far as them looking up the different, I guess, deleted chromosomes. That's over my head. So What I thought was so interesting was actually hearing that side and him talking about the genetic side of things that most of us and even like even doctors, it's a lot over their heads. And that's I mean, I know it's we think that it's only over our head. It's it's fascinating that this is so complex that everybody is struggling with it. Exactly. But we do need to strive to be educated because there's a lot at stake in this and constantly stay up to date. This isn't something that, okay, I know all about schizophrenia now. Goodbye. Like. There's so many emerging things as they're working on all the genetic side of it, but also medications being developed, therapies. So so we all need to stay current in the different treatments. As somebody who experienced symptoms as a child, who is now an adult, was there anything that he said that was surprising to you? He didn't hit on it much, but when he said the youngest age was four, that's so young to me. How, how do you yeah, distinguish at age four? what's pretend and what's not. And so it fascinates me that they're able to do that, that they're able to figure out, you know, the difference between which kids have autism, which kids are just over imaginative and which kids, yeah, have psychosis. That just fascinates me. I was really surprised by what he said about the parents, because a lot of the things that we hear and read is that parents are just really rejecting this idea and they're fighting hard against it and they're scared to get help. And all of those things are true, but his perspective is different. He said that by the time that they reach him, they're they're desperate and they're scared and they're looking for answers. And that's something that I hadn't considered. How did that hit you as a person living with schizophrenia? I really like that he said that because it made me think, oh yeah, because that's kind of how I was. I didn't know what was going on and I was desperate for help. At first I was I couldn't find like a good counselor because I didn't know I needed a psychologist. <laughs> um and I could just like as he was talking, I could picture myself Being in that situation of just, I'm so worried, no one is helping me, I don't know what to do. And the fact that it's about your child is so much deeper. Are you encouraged by the amount of research and about the amount of knowledge that is going on in the country right now? I found it so encouraging that he was able to tell us all these different projects that they're working on, all this different research that's currently being done, all these different like kids they're looking at and trying to help. That's incredible to me. And that gives me so much hope. A lot of times when you do get the diagnosis of schizophrenia or another mental illness, it's just like, oh no, your world is ending. And it's just a lot of fear. And I just like that he had so much hope for the future, where this was all going. It wasn't, you know, him talking about the research, it wasn't like, oh, well, give up, guys. Um, It was like, just things you're finding out that are different, that are new. And I love that. So how I'm being treated right now could be completely different in two years. Who knows what could happen? And that's so encouraging to me. I liked his overall message of, uh, listen, this is a medical illness and you need medical treatment because we're doing medical research and we're constantly learning and we're constantly growing and we have a plan. And if it doesn't work out, we'll make another plan. And I think that's very, very important, especially for people wrestling with whether or not to have their child diagnosed or to see a doctor. I really hope that people can listen to that and really hear that there's so much going on. And the outcome is uh, Rachel Starr's life right now. The outcome is is adults living well uh, in spite of their illness. And, and I think that that's a really, really valuable and important message for a parent who's struggling whether to take the next steps. And just on that note, 
not even just so much living well, but being able to live. A lot of times when you have this diagnosis, it's hard to even consider the future at all. It's hard to picture yourself alive next year. And for me, I don't know, that gave me like some amazing hope the way he was talking that I don't have to like be so worried about the future. I don't have to worry that, you know, my brain's just going to fall apart and I'm going to end up in a mental institution. Like that's, that was just so cool though, that he's saying like all the different changes that are coming. I think that that's incredible. Rachel, where do you as a person living with schizophrenia fall on this? What's your, what's your takeaways? If this was the situation of my child had schizophrenia, if I had a child, I would want them to get the best treatment possible and I would strive to help them in any way. I personally would still want them to have an amazing, awesome, cool, normal childhood. I wouldn't want to just be like, okay, well, I'm dropping you off at the hospital. See you in six months. (laughs) But for me and people out there who might be scared of getting a diagnosis, you can get a diagnosis. You do not have to tell the world. <laughs> I do know we're on a podcast about it, but you can keep it quiet, but don't let the stigma and the fear hold you back from getting your child help or getting yourself help. Thank you everyone for tuning in to this month's episode of Inside Schizophrenia. Subscribe, like, and share this episode on social media. My name is Rachel Starr, and I will see you next month. Inside Schizophrenia is presented by PsychCentral.com, America's largest and longest operating independent mental health website. Your host, Rachel Starr Withers, can be found online at rachelstarlive.com. Co-host Gabe Howard can be found online at gabehoward.com. For questions or to provide feedback, please email talkback at psychcentral.com. The official website for Inside Schizophrenia is psychcentral.com is. Thank you for listening, and please share widely.